to the organizer for the invitation. And also thanks, Diane, uh, for this nice um, event to uh, talk about our work. So um, first of all, just let me clear the air. Uh, I'm not a biologist and I'm not an experimentalist. So that's the first part. I'm a modeler. But in my defense, I'm a modeler who works very closely to um, experimental uh, colleagues. So the, the talk I'm, uh, I'm about to uh, show today is basically about a very simple model um, and some experimental results which are kind of uh, going together. And this is kind of the prelude of a more theoretical work that Diane is going to present later. So the, the, the problem I'm interested about is the um, process of regeneration of the spinal cord of the axolot group and, uh, and the role of cell proliferation in this particular case. So the um, talk is going to be like this. I'm going to give a brief overview of the problem of the spinal cord regeneration in this animal. And then I will, I'm going to present some previous results concerning how important uh, proliferation is for uh, determining the uh, process of regeneration in this animal and in, in this particular tissue of the animal. And then this will lead us to pose some questions that we want to answer. And then I will try to answer those questions by using a very simple and naive phenomenological mathematical model, um, which later will be compared with some new experimental uh, evidence that, that we got uh, a few months ago. And, uh, and this will lead to some conclusions and some perspectives linking to the uh, Ams talk. So basically, uh, I just want to say that if uh, some of you has an injury in the spinal cord, um, uh, what's going to happen in the best case scenario if you don't die is that you are going to have like a, a scare formation process. Uh, nevertheless, there are animals like uh, uh, the zebrafish, for instance, or the axolotl, which uh, even though they are vertebrates, they are able to regenerate very, very nicely and very fast. And uh, it, it's, we can imagine that we have like a kind of imaginary switch uh, from scar formation to tissue regeneration. And what we would like to understand is how we can turn on the switch, you know? Um, so uh, the problem of uh, uh, tissue amputation uh, is nicely studied with this very cute animal. So this is the, uh, Mexican salamander, the axolotl, the Amistoma mexicanum. And uh, this animal is uh, fantastically able to regenerate many portions of the body. Like for instance, if you cut here the limb, it's going to regenerate completely. And it, there is no way you could actually identify later whether the regenerated limb is a regenerated one or the original one. There's no way to distinguish that. Um, so the, the problem of how this animal is able to regenerate the tissues is actually a long-standing problem. So actually, we can see here, this is uh, uh, Spallanzini. So Lazzaro Spallanzini actually studied this problem more than 200 years ago. And he actually studied this in salamanders, looking regeneration of the limbs or the uh, tail, where the spinal cord actually is. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the spinal cord regeneration problem. So here you see the um, a longitudinal axis of the um, uh, of the axolotl. So here we could imagine that there is the head, and this is the tail of the animal. And in green, you would, in green you would see the uh, spinal cord. And what we see is that if we wait uh, more or less uh, one week, uh, we observe that the after amputation, the most almost two millimeters of the spinal cord are being regenerated. So um, if we see now a transversal section of the tissue, uh, so a perpendicular plane to the one we saw before, we see here the protagonist of the story. So these are the ependymal cells over here, which form this kind of pseudostratified epithelium, which is surrounding this hole that you see here, which is, is a lumen uh, covered by a cerospinal fluid. And so these ependymal cells over here, they are the responsible for the process of regeneration. Um, and so you see here that six days post amputation, more or less, you have like 30 cells here uh, in the circumference. And uh, along the AP axis, the anterior posterior axis, so the anterior posterior axis is this one, anterior posterior, this is the AP axis, anterior posterior axis. Along this AP axis, which is the perpendicular to this plane we see here, the cells have a diameter of uh, 10 microns, more or less, just to give you some 
uh, numbers concerning that. So Aida Rodrigo Albors uh, back in Dresden uh, realized that uh, when you cut the spinal cord of this tissue, uh, what we observe in this ependymal cells is an upregulation of genes which are related to proliferation. And there is a downregulation of genes which are related to differentiation, so neurogenesis in this case. Um, and she also identified uh, functionally what happened with these uh, ependymal cells. And what we learned from that is that these cells actually uh, accelerate the cell cycle. So the cell cycle length goes from, let's say, 12 to uh, 14 days uh, to more or less uh, three times uh, smaller than that. So there is an acceleration of the cell cycle. Uh, you can imagine that this is a very slow process, right? Because we, we see that one cell needs like, in the, in the fastest case, uh, this cell needs like, like four or five days to complete the cell cycle, right? So it's kind of a slow process that we see here. And what we see is that in order for this to happen, uh, this acceleration of the cell cycles is happening because of reduction of G1 phase and S phase. So these are the two phases of the cell cycle which are being reduced uh, to accelerate the cell cycle and therefore to reduce the cell cycle length. Um, so uh, this, in, in a way, this uh, helps us to understand that in a way what's happening is that there is a kind of going back in time for these cells. So these cells are going back in the sense that they are acquiring a more uh, proliferative uh, like phenotype. So they are like uh, kind of recapitulating programs of development, of early development. So we went on after that and basically we tried to understand how the proliferation events are distributed along the space, and in particular along the AP axis. So how these divisions of cells change, if they do, uh, along the AP axis during the process of regeneration. So what we did was to first try to characterize the density of these ependymal cells along the AP axis, and what we found was a negative result. So we didn't observe any significant change, let's say any significant heterogeneity along the AP axis, both in the uninjured animals or in the regenerating animals. Uh, the same thing happened when we tracked the density of mitosis, so let's say the density of um, uh, divisions, and so, or, or the density of proliferating cells. And so we didn't see any spatial pattern along the AP axis. But from day four on, we observed the following thing. So we observed that from day four on, post amputation, there is a spatial pattern here in the sense that we have here closer to the amputation plane, which is here in zero AP position, we have a kind of upregulation of mitosis here compared to more anterior regions. So we characterize this further and we kind of build this sort of space, uh, phase space, if you like. So this is like time post amputation in days, and that would be the AP uh, position along the AP axis in mitons. So this point here is zero, would be the amputation plane. And what we see here is this curve over here is the outlook of the spinal cord. And what we observe is that before day four, there is no heterogeneity, no spatial heterogeneity over the AP axis. And all of these, in this area, all the cells proliferate slowly and boringly, if you like. And from day four on, we see two phases of uh, cell proliferation. There is one phase here more uh, anterior, uh, which is proliferating low as before, and there is this area here which proliferate faster. So basically what we learned back then by using a very simple model approach, uh, we learned that this high proliferation area that we have here is enough to accelerate the cell cycle to drive the process of regeneration in the axle of the spinal cord. Uh, but there are some questions that actually we want to pose, and these are the questions that we are going to try to answer today in this part of the talk. So basically, we want to know which is the mechanism which is uh, imposing this separation phases here. And uh, so, and why we have a switch point which starts to emerge uh, from day four on and not before or after. And why this switch point separating these two zones is in minus 800 microns. And why, pay attention to that, why this curve, this switch point curve, as we call it, is moving posteriorly as a function of time. So that, those are the questions that we want to understand. So in order to answer those questions, we build a very simple and naive mathematical model 
uh, so this this model is uh, it's a cell based model and so we basically have a one dimensional set uh, of cells so they are arranged in a line which basically correspond to the ap axis and uh, what we assume is a particular dynamics of cell proliferation that i'm going to explain in a second so basically we start from an initial condition in which all of these cells over there they basically have a certain uh, uh, cell cycle length which we assume is log normally distributed. And we also assume that at time zero, the position of each of those cells along the corresponding cell cycle is a random one. And in particular, we assume a, an exponential uh, distribution for that. Um, so these are the two characteristics that makes this model a stochastic one, if you like. Uh, so once we assume that, then uh, basically we consider that Let's assume for a moment that there are two cells in this example, which actually pass by the border uh, of M, uh, G1. So when this happens, basically these cells have to divide. So these are two cells which are about to divide. Okay, so these are two mother cells. And what we assume is that when this cell divides, the one of the daughter cells inherit the same position of the mother. And, the, and then there is a new cell which is created, translocating, if you like, between the mother cell and the most posterior cell. And as a consequence of that, the whole tissue moves posteriorly, okay? So this is a very simple model of homeostatic development for the tissue, okay? So now we are going to assume that we will amputate the tissue and we do this in the, this very sophisticated manner, meaning that we just remove a lot of the cells in the posterior side. And when we do that, we remain, so we, we see these remaining N0 cells in the anterior side. And what we assume is that there is a signal which is uh, initiated here in the amputation plane and uh, basically propagates with constant velocity posteriorly up until a certain time tau. And uh, so it means that up to this point, the signal is being propagating uh, and it's, um, it is uh, recruiting the ependymal cells in this area. Up to this time tau, uh, which leads to certain length over the AP axis that we will call lambda. And by recruitment, what I mean is the following mechanism. So what we assume is that when this signal passed by a certain cell, at the moment in which this signal passed by the cell, basically we assume the following thing. We assume that this, the, the cell which is about to be recruited has this long cell cycle with this particular uh, S and G1 phases and G2 plus M phases. And then we assume that if a cell is somewhere along G1, it follows what we call as G1 skipping mechanism, which means that all of the cells which are here in coordinates along this cell cycle here in the moment of recruitment, then all of them are going to end up being here in this uh, position. But if they are somewhere here, they are going to be cycling as before. So what this model produces is a partial synchronization of those cells. Okay, so all of the cells which were here are going to be here, and all of these cells which were here are continuing as before. That's why it's a partial synchronization mechanism. Uh, so for the cells which are in the S phase, what we assume is a uh, mapping mechanism, meaning that if you are a cell which is in S and you're in the 50% of the long S, you're going to be in the 50% of the short S. So this is a kind of conservative mechanism that we assume for S phase. The resulting uh, uh, phenomenon is that in the end, what we are going to have is a short cell cycle, okay? Um, so when this is basically consistent with what I just told you, right? That the, the acceleration of the cell cycle in the axolotl leads to a reduction of S and G1, and as a consequence of that, a reduction of the whole cell cycle. So that's the uh, recruitment uh, does in this model. And basically, what we uh, assume is that uh, if we can track the position of what we call the recruitment limit, which is the most posterior cell from all of these recruited cells. So this is the recruitment limit. If we monitor this, we can see two things. If we wait long enough, we will see that this recruitment limit curve at some point will overlap the experimental switch point curve if the model is correct. And, um, uh, and then there is something which is a little bit counterintuitive and to me kind of nice, which is the reason of why this switch point curve is uh, posteriorly moving 
is not due to the fact that you have something here, uh, uh, let's say, instructed by the signal, but it's actually something due to the boring condition that we have over here in the anterior part. So in the anterior part, we still have low proliferation. And this low proliferation is pushing away the cells and therefore the limit, the, the, the switch point between, I mean, the recruitment limit between the non-recruited cell and the recruited cells. So that's basically the idea. So uh, what we did was to um, parameterize the model with the dynamics of uh, cell cycle uh, that we have acquired uh, in the axolotl spinal for uh, regeneration process and also some geometrical characteristics of the cells. And uh, so the only parameters we don't know anything about in the model are those three I just showed you. So the uh, remaining number of cells after amputation, this lambda, uh, so the maximum recruitment distance here and the maximum time of recruitment. So those parameters we know nothing about. So in order to uh, estimate these parameters, but more importantly, to try to see whether this model has anything to do with reality, we um, fitted this uh, model, in particular this recruitment limit curve, with the experimental switch point curve, which we obtained before. So this is what Emmanuel Curacosta, a PhD student in my lab, um, did. So this is the fitting of the model. So these are uh, many uh, simulations uh, that we see and uh, at the same time, and uh, this is the AP position as a function of time, and these are the three switch point curve uh, points that I just mentioned before. And in blue, we see the recruitment limit from the model. So this is the best fitting uh, result. So the model successfully produced this data, and according to the model, uh, there is a signal uh, which has a maximum recruitment length of 800 microns, and it lasts about uh, almost four days uh, post amputation. Uh, but I just want to emphasize that this is nothing really challenging, right? Because I, I just fit an exponential, I mean, a curve of three points with a three parameters model, right? There's nothing really challenging. The interesting thing comes now. So with this model parameterized in this way, what we can do is make a prediction. So what we did was a prediction of how it would look like the outgrowth of the spinal cord if this model would be correct. So this is how the outgrowth of the spinal cord of the axolotl looks like according to this model. So we basically compare this with uh, experimental data. Uh, so as you can see, the prediction of the model satisfy the experimental outgrowth that we acquire at some point. Um, so we went on and we tested a uh, limiting a scenario in which we assume that there is no recruitment. So what would happen if we stop the process of recruitment? Okay, if we stop the signal doing what in principle we presume it's doing. So when this happened, this is the prediction of the model, right? And uh, so we compare this uh, scenario from the model with an experiment from a colleague of ours, Ji Feng Fei, back then in Dresden, now in China, um, uh, so he basically did knockdown experiments of SOX2, this gene which we know is important for to, to root proliferation in the uh, process of regeneration of the spinal cord, and we see that um, this kind of coincide. So we also characterize uh, some uh, other characteristics of the of the experimental system in which we. So we, what we did was to track individual cells in vivo in the axolotl spinal cord during the process of regeneration. And with this, we were able to quantify trajectories of those cells as a function of time along the spinal cord. And with this, we were able to determine the profile of the spatial profile of velocities in this displacement that the cells have in the process of regeneration. So basically, the model is able to qualitatively recapitulate this. And, uh, and also, the model shows a uh, scaling of the positions of the cells as a function of time uh, during the process of uh, regeneration, which is in, it's, it's a nice attribute for a model which try to mimic a uh, regeneration scenario. Um, so the, the last prediction of the model that I'm going to show you is that um, uh, so we in the model what we assume is that we have a reduction of both G1 phase and S phase, and so this is the prediction of the outgrowth. Uh, this and other simulations just with the same parameterization in which we see the outgrowth as a, as a function of time 
for this case in which we have the reduction of both, G1 and S. And this is the same thing when we do not have reduction neither from G1 nor from S. So these are the two same uh, simulations I just showed you before. But now we are in the position to ask what would happen if we only reduce G1 or if we only reduce S, something that we cannot test experimentally. And so this is what we learned. So when we reduce S but not G1, so this is the curve we got, which means that up until day five, basically S seems to be sufficient to, to the reduction of S seems to be sufficient to uh, get this outgrowth dynamics that we have. But from day five on, it looks like we also need to reduce G1 uh, in terms of the outgrowth. But listen, this is important. Uh, the only thing I'm saying here is uh, how important is S reduction for the outgrowth response. Uh, so um, I'm just saying that because G1 reduction is also important for something else, which is not the outgrowth, which I'm not showing here. Um, so two key facts from the model are basically that there is a partial synchronization phenomenon in G1 and that uh, the model is consistent with uh, a signal which is propagated over 18, uh, 800 microns uh, over the AP axis during uh, almost four, uh, four days. So we try to uh, experimentally address this and uh, basically Leo Tsuki from uh, the IMP, he, uh, there or here, I don't know how to say that, in Vienna. Um, so uh, Leo Tsuki in Elitanaka's lab uh, basically designed a plasmid uh, uh, in which he used the Fuxi technique. So by using this technique, he's able to, uh, to make it short to see cells in G1 phase or in S phase. Actually, to be more correct, he's able to see cells in G0, G1 as green cells and cells which are in S or G2 as magenta cells. And so he basically uh, electroporated uh, this plasmid in um, uh, a culture line and a stable culture line from the exoloto, which is called AL1. And this is what you can see uh, from this experiment. So this is one cell that we see over time. And so we see that these cells start magenta and then at some point becomes green, right? And the same, the same thing here. So we see some cells which start be green and then it turns out to be magenta. But with that, we see that the, 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 the um, system is working. So he tested this and he created uh, transgenic uh, axolotls and this is how they look like. Uh, so this is a transgenic axolotl that was clear and in there we see a lateral view and a dorsal view and a transversal uh, section. So here we see, for instance, the notochord. So, and this here is the neural tube, that is the spinal cord. And there we see in green the cells in G1 and in magenta the cells which are in S phase. So here, for instance, we see one uh, magenta cell, one cell in uh, S phase. So then what we see was basically what happened if we amputated the, these guys. So we amputated the spinal cord. And then what we observe is that this is time zero, this is day three, day five, we see a kind of border between, so here we don't see any spatial pattern recognizable, but then we see that as a function of time, there is a border in separating a high density of magenta cells, S cells, from G1 cells. And this is kind of uh, spreading over the spinal cord and covering everything up. So um, we, uh, uh, Emmanuel uh, Costa quantified this and basically we were able to, uh, uh, by using a, a two-step model and also a ABC uh, fitting um, algorithm, we basically were able to determine whether we would have, again, a kind of switch point, but in this case, a G1S switch point along the AP axis. And we learned that only at date four and five we see a significant switch point separating two uh, heterogeneous, uh, two, two zones, uh, two homogeneous zones, let's say. So uh, then we went back with our model and we investigated whether if we look for cells which are in G1 or in S, uh, we can see the same thing. And basically we see that at day four and five, there is a switch point of, G, uh, of S cells and G1 cells, which kind of coincide with the vertical area, which is the experimentally obtained G1 switch. And the same thing at day five. 
So we can see the same thing here. So this is the, the, fa the same phase space we saw before. So this is time for some rotation. This is the AP uh, position. So here we see in blue the same recruitment limit curve I showed you before. And uh, these two points are the experimentally obtained G1S switch points. So we see that they kind of coincide. And we see uh, these points, gray, um, I think this is orange, um, they, they correspond to the transition of cells from G1 to S in the model. And these are the non-recruited cells and these are the recruited cells. So uh, this is just how the uh, simulations of the model look like. So in the top panel, we see the AP axis and uh, in, the, in the horizontal axis and in the Y axis, we see different simulations. Uh, so 20 simulations actually. And in green, you see the cells in G1 and in magenta, you see the cells in S. And uh, in here you see the border, which is basically the outgrowth, which is also represented here as a function of time. And here we see the, uh, so the recruitment limit. Um, and you see that there is kind of a border of, a, an, of an area of magenta, which represents the cells in S, which is, you know, uh, growing. And uh, so this border is, is going to be more noticeable later at day four and five. So let me just uh, finish uh, this, uh, the conclusions. Uh, so basically, in, in this talk, I just show you a very simple, very naive mathematical model uh, in 1D, which is uh, able to uh, explain that, uh, uh, let's say, that the experimental switch point curve that we have is consistent with one signal which propagates over 800 microns and or, uh, during 80 hours, more or less four days, uh, until uh, and, and and also that the um, movement of the uh, switch point towards most posterior locations is due to the boring cell cycle, uh, which is happening more anteriorly uh, from the cells which are not being recruited. We also learned that the uh, reductions of G1 and S have a different importance along the along uh, the time of regeneration um, and uh, for the outgrowth. That's the, the final part. And we also recapitulated these uh, results from the model qualitatively with the FUXI experiments I just showed you in the end. Uh, here there is, uh, the, the, this article is in Biotypes now, and so you can check it out if you like. And then let me just end with perspectives to, links to, to link this talk with the next one. So basically what we did so far is to imagine that the spinal cord is a row of cells, right? Well, it's, uh, as you can see, this is the AP axis, and this is the perpendicular plane. So this is the longitudinal section I showed you before. And here you see the ventral dorsal or dorsal ventral axis. And, and, and you can see that clearly this is nothing really homogeneous, right? Uh, so these are the experiments performed by uh, Fatkin uh, alias Wilson Lu um, in the IMP, and also in the South China Normal University with Ji Feng Fei. Um, and so, uh, with the help of Augusto Borges and also Wilson, we develop a tool which is called SCOT, which is uh, it's a computational pipeline which is able to extract topological and geometrical characteristics of the spinal cord tissue uh, to then do proper quantification. SCOT stands for spinal cord transformation, but also system of coordinates transformation, that's what it does. So that's just to say that if we use tools like this, then we will be able to have more important relevant information because, you know, it might be the case that the spinal cord is not exactly one dimensional. So um, that's why it would be interesting to try to understand uh, this process by using a more sophisticated model, uh, including uh, more spatial dimensions on one hand. And on the other hand, the model I just presented uh, assumes that the signal, as I said, moves, you know, with constant velocity over the tissue. So it's a very phenomenological uh, model. So without any physical basis, if you like. So it would be interesting to see whether a more physically uh, based model, uh, assuming a reaction diffusion scheme, could actually recapitulate this process. That's why my uh, colleagues and friends, Bianca Richard and Valeria Cagliario, uh, did some nice work that Diane is going to present. So with this, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, mainly El, uh, Eli Tanaka, 
uh, in the IMP in Vienna, uh, Leo Tsuki, who did the Fuxi experiments I show you, uh, Wilson Lu, who did these last experiments I show you, and is working with Augusto Borges in the SCORP computational pipeline. And most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge Emmanuel Curacosta, who's uh, basically whose work and PhD work I just presented today. And now let's go to see uh, Diane's talk. So Diane, and thank you all uh, very much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. So uh, can you stop sharing so I can yes. start mine? Yeah, I did that already. Perfect. Thanks. Do you see my screen? Yes, it's not yes. full screen. Yet. Yes. Up. Now it is. Thank you. No, it's okay. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, so first of all, uh, I thank the organizers for the invitation to this uh, very nice workshop, and thank you very much, Osvaldo, for this very nice introduction to our work now. So, um, uh, we'll continue. I will build on the the first 1D model that uh, Osvaldo presented uh, before, uh, in in order to um, to in, um, to do a, a 2D model. So, what we the, what I will present is in the frame of the PhD of Valeria Cagliaro at INRIA Paris and of course uh, co-directed by uh, Osvaldo. And uh, so we are developing actually a 2D hybrid agent-based continuous model for the regeneration of axolotl spinal cord. So I think uh, the, the evolution of, uh, of this system is uh, experimentally well explained by uh, the previous talk, but I will come back to some, uh, some of the points that were mentioned before. So the, the goal of, uh, of uh, these uh, works are, uh, is twofold. First is to extend the 1D model to a 2D setting. Uh, as Osvaldo pointed out, actually there are some, so the 1D model developed is a very sim simple, uh, simple um, approximation of, uh, of the regeneration of the whole tissue. And based also on the fact that cell differentiation is only, uh, is only directed towards one axis that is basically the anterior posterior axis of the axolotl so along the tail. This is one approximation due to the fact that we are in 1D. So the idea is to build a more realistic model going to 2D with uh, in keeping in mind that what we want uh, basically at the end is a, is a 3D model to model the whole tissue. This would be a direct perspective. And the second goal of, uh, of, this, uh, of this work is to uh, also bring uh, an understanding of the coupling in between this cell uh, acceleration of cell proliferation due to a chemical signal that evolves in the tissue in some way. So what we wanted to bring is a, a, with this new model is a um, kind of a more realistic evolution of um, the morphogens that are responsible for higher cell proliferation. And this is what I will uh, present today and explore the influence of the morphogen dynamics on the tissue response reconstruction suite. So uh, we'll start with some uh, references. So on the biological viewpoint, there have been a tremendous amount of works who studied the um, influence of morphogen in tissue development in general, and notably the works of uh, Anna Kicheva, uh, for instance, in this two very nice paper where the, the authors uh, are interested in the uh, um, formation of a, fly, uh, of a fly wing and uh, looking at the kinetics and um, extracting some uh, parameters about the morphogens that are involved in, this, uh, in the development of this tissue, extracting, for instance, proliferation rate, degradation rate, and diffusion speeds of this morphogen and how this can impact the evolution of the, of the tissue. So, um, this, uh, this will be of great help to, to help us for our model to choose uh, relevant uh, parameters. And in terms of mathematical modeling, so since the seminal works of uh, Turing, Turing in 1952, um, there have been a lot of works on reaction diffusion systems. You will see that this is one of the main bases of uh, morphogen evolution in our model. And a lot of works were considering reaction diffusion equation through PD, a partial differential equation on uh, on fixed domains, and some works, uh, some some uh, uh, research groups studied also the influence of the uh, growth of the domain 
on the pattern formation of morphogen diffusing inside this uh, growing domain and also on the, on the group. Um, but basically, this works uh, uh, for the group of Pantin, so these, uh, these um, uh, papers that I cite here, uh, mainly assume, uh, pre prescribe the growth of the tissue and look at the influence of this growth on the uh, evolution of the morphogen. So, and few works are devoted to actually uh, couple the cell proliferation, so the domain growth, to the concentration of the morphogen that are inside. Some of, uh, of uh, so some people uh, were interested in this reaction diffusion model where cell proliferation is actually linked to the local concentration of this morphogen, such as in this paper of uh, Navy, Matthews, and Dean, and also this paper on the vertebrate limb bud of uh, Dino and Otmer. And there are other, uh, other works uh, in the group of Baker that were also studying reaction diffusion and how the uh, domain growth impacts uh, the correlation when we want to pass from agent-based to continuous model for the tissue uh, cells. And this is uh, something that we want to do later. So this is uh, just to give a, a very broad uh, overview of uh, what has been done in the literature. So now let me uh, go inside uh, the domain, uh, the model that, uh, that we propose. So first I recall the, set, the experimental setting uh, uh, for building our model. So we consider uh, the tail of an axolotl that is amputated as presented by Oswaldo before. And uh, we are interesting, interested in the tissue outgrowth that is induced by this amputation based on the working hypothesis that uh, tissue uh, growth is mainly due to acceleration of cell proliferation that is induced by the presence of a morphogen uh, that diffuses in the tissue and locally recruits cells to increase their, uh, their cell cycle. Okay, so there are some, um, so in the concept, in the, in the broad concept of the tissue organization, uh, there are some, uh, some uh, so the model is, uh, is uh, close to the Wendy model that was presented before, but there are a lot of differences also in the sense that we take into account the mechanics, the evolution uh, uh, of special evolution of the tissue cells and chemical signal is not uh, modeled in the same way. So let me uh, go into the model ingredients. So our goal was to look for a minimal model with as few many agents as possible because we want really to focus on some, uh, some specific interaction. So we just consider two sets of agents, the tissue cells that will be represent, modeled as 2D spheres of center X, I and fixed radius R. This is the agent-based part of the model. And then the morphogen, so morphogen concentration, will be a model as a continuous field described by its den local density rho, um, that we call rho s, depending on space and time. So the model is kept two-dimensional, but it's simple enough to be easily extensible in 3D. So we'll talk in the perspectives of this work. And now I will go in the details of the mechanisms. So the mechanics of the, of the tissue uh, is based on the, on the hypothesis that cells are, uh, are incompressible, and so they interact with each other through mechanical interaction to, uh, exclu uh, for volume exclusion to exclude overlapping of the cells. So the idea is that at every time, uh, of, uh, at every time cells will be in the configuration, a non-overlapping configuration. And what breaks the, this, uh, this stable configuration is the presence of biological phenomena that will provide overlap. So given a perturbed con uh, configuration, uh, here, we suppose that cells will reorganize instantly in order to uh, avoid the non-overlapping and we use a very basic uh, gradient descent of uh, total potential measuring actually the total overlapping of the pairs of cells. Uh, I will talk about boundary conditions later, of course, uh, in the domain. So now let me go back to, uh, uh, let me go now to the evolution in time of the continuous field of uh, injury signaling chemicals, so morphogens. So we suppose that it's a continuous field of density rho s that is uh, permanently uh, produced. So we have a source at the uh, front of the tissue. How do we model that? Is, uh, we model it with a reaction term here that depends on the gradient of the cells. So we can imagine that if cells are in, in um, non-overlapping uh, 
optimal configuration here, the gradient is zero. The large uh, values of the gradient will be located at the front of the tissue here. And we use this uh, psi function that is a sigmoid function just to detect the, the, the high gradient zone. So that is basically, you can imagine that cells will appear uh, on the front. With the rate nu p, so let me make it clear now for the, for the later, later talk, we use nu p basically infinite. That means a very large uh, gross um, production rate of ISP. Of course, we, we produce ISP up until a density threshold, right? So basically, if the growth rate is very fast, you can imagine that uh, this uh, production thing uh, is uh, like a directly boundary condition that imposes that at any time in the tissue front, we have rho star uh, density of cells that are created like a source, right? The source is moving because of the motion of the tissue. Okay. <laughs> I hope it was clear. Now we consider also a natural degradation of the morphogen. So we suppose that morphogen disappear with a constant rate nu d, that is a parameter of the model. And finally, we suppose that morphogen diffuse in the tissue by uh, introducing this diffusive term that depends on the density of tissue cells in order to avoid that morphogen diffuse in the void, right? Or in the void, or in the, in the part, uh, rest of the, of the domain. So, Okay, so this is the dynamics for chemical signal. So we have, we can see it as a boundary, a directly boundary condition on the domain defined by the tissue cells. And uh, we consider Neumann boundary condition in here. We just erase the, the ISP that would disappear outside of the system. And for both tissue cells and, uh, and injury signaling chemicals, we would consider periodic boundary condition on top and of, on the bottom of the domain because uh, the, the domain space in the axolotl is like if you have the AP axis here, we are actually looking at the uh, cells that are in the circumference. So uh, we just uh, consider the condition here to be on the torus in the y direction. So this would be, you can imagine that this is the AP axis of the axolotl. Okay. Uh, now, uh, the last biological phenomena, the third phenomenon that uh, we consider here, is cell division for the, for the tissue cells. So this is the main hypothesis of the model, is the coupling in between morphogens and cells, and we suppose that it only happens uh, through the cell division rate. So before, uh, without any signal, we suppose, uh, as Osvaldo said in, in his talk, that uh, tissue cells have a natural uh, division rate, nu zero, so before being recruited. And when the signal is, is present, so where the density of cell is non-zero, then we suppose that cells can be recruited, and that means that the proliferation rate would be increased by this factor nu one that is also a parameter of the model. So we use again a, a, a sigmoid function psi, and we will consider different form of this function. So the first simulation will be shown with a very sharp uh, sharp um, sigmoid. That means you can see basically as an indicator function. So that would mean that cells will uh, accelerate their proliferation rate directly when they sense at least one ISP particle around them. But we can also, and we left uh, this, uh, the, the, this freedom to consider different um, coupling in between cell proliferation and ISP density. For instance, we, we went uh, up until this, uh, this uh, relation here to say that uh, cell will accelerate um, almost linearly as function of the uh, number of, uh, I, of uh, as function, sorry, of the local concentration sensed around them. This would be an important parameter that we'll see at the end. And what happens when cell divide? So we suppose that when they divide, they just uh, create a daughter cell that we position uh, in a ball centered in the mother cell and of diameter, a diameter of a cell, something like that. And uh, okay, in, and in, in this first model, this, okay, this is ongoing works. So it's, uh, it's only uh, the first simulation that we did. We biased actually the uh, differentiation of cell to say that the daughter cells will appear uh, in um, will divide according to the IP, AP axis with an angle from the mother cell that is plus or minus theta over eight. So in, in this first version of the model, we consider that cell differentiation is biased in direction of the AP axis also, because we wanted to compare it to the 1D model also 
that was proposed before. Okay, so uh, just okay. So these are the ingredients of the model. Now, uh, a small word about the numericals that, uh, methods that are employed. So we um, actually uh, we discretize the continuous um, morphogen concentration uh, density rho s using a, a smooth particle hydrodynamic method means that actually we pass from a continuous to a agent-based uh, kind of, uh, of treatment for the, for the reaction diffusion thing using the diff diffusion velocity method that was first proposed by Musli S in 1990. So how does it consist of? It's just saying that we will approximate the continuous flow rho, rho S by a set of, um, of discrete agent position at position YA. And we will uh, approximate the continuous uh, variation as a linear combination of, uh, in the sense of, uh, of uh, measure, uh, against this Dirac delta. And then, uh, as uh, was described in the diffusion velocity method, we can recover using the uh, continue, uh, PDE equation uh, for rho s, we can recover the trajectories of the individual particles um, that will move with this velocity that is the gradient rho uh, over rho, rho being a smoothen uh, interpretation of uh, or a linear combination of Dirac delta with a smoothing Garnell W. So basically this is the average number of particles that are around one particle. Okay, so this is a way to actually uh, compute, uh, discretize uh, our PDE in a way that it's, it's kind of uh, more convenient than uh, methods that are based, uh, for instance, finite element methods or things like that, because we don't depend on a grid. This is uh, why, why we chose this method actually. So the engine, so now the, the morphogen concentration can be seen as a set of particles, right? So this, this is what we will call injury signaling particles. They are introduced through the tissue front according to the uh, production rate that we talked about before. We suppose that they are removed randomly according to a Poisson process of intensity mu d. So this is just natural degradation and they will be removed when they reach the left, uh, the left wall. So just a word about the uh, basic algorithm, but because actually we have different time scales in this, in this model, so it's important to, uh, so I wanted to emphasize how we treat it numerically, this, uh, this model. So in between time step t and uh, t plus delta t, delta t being, um, being a parameter, uh, so what we do first is to introduce uh, ISP particles in the front of the tissue so that the uh, density at this uh, at the front is uh, correspond to the directly density of star. Then the, we let the injury uh, signaling particles move uh, of, uh, with the velocity uh, method that we had before. Then we do a step in a cell division by uh, measuring the, the ISP the particles that are around the cells in order to be recruited or not. And this leads to the creation of new cells around the old cells, so that creates overlapping. Right, so we let the tissue evolve, uh, um, the tissue cells reorganize mechanically in order to minimize the, uh, the overlapping potential and to lead to the new configuration uh, without overlapping. So this is the algorithm. Let me show you now a typical simulation uh, that uh, we obtain. So on the left part, you have some uh, images of uh, experiments uh, that you can find in the paper of Rust and uh, co-authors in 2016 in eLife. So it's basically the ones uh, also that uh, Osvaldo presented in his talk. So these are screenshots um, of axolotl tail at uh, different days after amputation. So day two, four, six, and eight, uh, where you have the amputation plane that is uh, 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 here, uh, drawn with, uh, with dash, dash line. And this is a typical simulation of our model where uh, the amputation plane is here in blue. I don't know if you see it. And at uh, the exact same date. So before going into the simulations, maybe let me talk about the model parameters that we use. So so there are some uh, model parameters that uh, are measured experimentally. So Osvaldo already said that the diameter of a cell was around 10 micrometer. So the radius actually, it's uh, okay, we use the value 6.6 uh, micrometer because it's a 30 micrometer diameter. 
Okay, this enabled us to uh, actually um, calibrate the space scale. Uh, so the non-recruited cell proliferation rate, so without any uh, morphogens, would be set to 0.06. This was measured experimentally, and we suppose that the maximal uh, proliferation rate, this was uh, also um, measured experimentally compared to the cell cycle length, is 0.21 day, uh, per day. So these, these uh, two parameters enable to calibrate the, the time scale. And now we have three parameters that we don't really know the value experimentally. Uh, is the uh, morphogen diffusion speed, the morphogen degradation rate, and the cell sensitivity, so the tissue cell sensitivity, to the local ISP density to increase the, to be recruited actually by the cell. So this is a typical uh, time frame of a simulation. What happens is that we amputate the tissue at day one before there are no ISP, so in the cell proliferate with the minimal prolifer normal proliferation rate. After amputation, we have apparition of a signal. Uh, so we have creation of ISP that uh, uh, diffuse in the tissue and degrade up until the end of the simulation. And we suppose that uh, the cell can uh, start to be recruited after day three where uh, here they can sense the signal, the, the chemical concentration around them to accelerate their uh, proliferation. Okay, so let me show you some typical simulations. Um, the idea is to uh, uh, study the influence of the diffusion speed, degradation rate, and sensitivity of tissue cells. So here it's a simulation with a small diffusion coefficient and a small degradation rate. I don't, so you don't see it, right? I have to do, I have to do that. Do you see the simulation now? Okay, perfect. So this is, uh, this is uh, one day after amputation. So you see that ISP particles are already created. And uh, so this is, uh, I don't remember, it's for small diffusion coefficient. So you see that, um, okay, after amputation, some ISP cells will, uh, will be created at the front and then they diffuse. So we see them, they diffuse very slowly here because the parameter D is very small and they are continuously produced at the front and they recruit cells while uh, in between the simulation. So the cells that sense the signal here accelerate the proliferation and this leads to an acceleration of the overall outgrowth of the tissue. So this is uh, for small diffusion coefficient. Now I will show a simulation for large diffusion coefficient. Okay. Okay, so this is the uh, same setting, but now the uh, D parameter is, uh, uh, is uh, increased. So we see that very fast, actually, the uh, ISP signal occupies the whole domain. So every cell is recruited. And so we see that the front is moving very fast. So you can imagine, so of course, the front now is just uh, the, the, I mean, the overall population of, of cell uh, proliferate at the speed of the, at the maximal speed that we put in the model and now a last simulation small diffusion coefficient and uh, and large isp death because so far the isp cells were living uh, during the whole simulation and now this is a typical simulation where actually the uh, the diffusion is small and the isp die very fast so you can see that uh, actually the concentration of ISP stays close to the to the frontier of the of the tissue, of course, because they don't have time actually to diffuse before dying. Um, and so and so the tissue outgrowth, of course, is reduced because less cells are recruited. And the only cells that are recruited are the ones at the front. So this is these are uh, kind of uh, three different regimes that we can observe. Um, as function of the parameter. And the first question that we ask is uh, what the ingredients we put in the model, are they sufficient to, uh, to um, explain or recover experimental data? So uh, on, uh, on this plot, you see experimental ad growth that was measured in uh, axolotl. So it was the first curve that, that Osvaldo showed in his talk. So regenerating axolotl. So you see the outgrowth in micrometer as function of times in days. And you have uh, the outgrowth that uh, is, is uh, simulated with different uh, sets of parameters. 
So for this set of parameters, you can imagine that the signal, uh, uh, the morphogen do not degrade because it's very small. And then we, uh, uh, we decrease the, uh, we increase, sorry, the degradation rate. And we see that this uh, decreases the overall growth of the tissue and that uh, for very uh, small degradation rate, then we recover actually the experimental data. So now the idea was to really um, uh, quantify the dependency of the outgrowth on these three parameters. And so this is what we did uh, here. We did uh, several simulations varying the diffusion coefficients and the degradation rate. And we observed here the outgrowth at day six, the outgrowth of the tissue. So we see that for very large degradation rates, uh, then the outgrowth is minimal. It's uh, correspond actually to the uh, to a very small outgrowth uh, due to all the cells dividing at a at a rate at a minimal rate. But when ISP uh, live fast enough, then we see first of all that the outgrowth is dependent on the diffusion coefficient, of course, and we see that the relation is uh, is not trivial here. And if we look at the uh, size of the ISP zone at day four, so this is what has been measured experimentally, what is nice is that we have a zone of the parameter space where we recover actually the, uh, the experimental data. So the experimental data with regenerating axolotl are lie in uh, this parameter space here, where the outgrowth was measured at uh, 1.2 millimeter plus or minus 0.3 millimeter. And the high proliferation zone that would correspond here to the ISP zone was um, of 800 uh, micrometer, as Osvaldo uh, pointed out in his talk. And so that means that uh, in our model, this corresponds to a very large uh, diffusion coefficient and a very small degradation rate means in order to recruit enough cells to reach the, uh, such an outgrowth. Uh, we have also a, a parameter space where we re recover the data uh, that Osvaldo presented also uh, done by Jifeng Fei, where actually this, uh, these uh, experiments were done on uh, uh, genetically modified axolotl that don't have the ability to regenerate because they are, um, there is this knockdown of some proteins that are induced in cell proliferation. And, uh, and this reduces the overall acceleration of the cell proliferation. And actually this corresponds in our uh, phase space here, in our set of parameters to a large degradation rate for the ISP. So that would correspond indeed of less recruited cells that lead to a, a smaller outgrowth. So these were uh, the, the first, uh, First analysis, uh, phase diagram analysis. So uh, yes, I forgot to say that uh, these data here were generated, uh, supposing that cells uh, accelerate their cell cycle as soon as there are there is some uh, partic morphogen particle around them. But we tested the influence of uh, the uh, sensitivity of cells to the ISP local den uh, density, and we can we we observed actually something that is very interesting is so the blue curve here is for uh, high sensitivity so these are these correspond to uh, the, the simulations that we saw so far and when we decrease the uh, this parameter h that means that cells are less and less uh, or more and more sensitivity to the absolute value of the uh, isp density then we can see a switch of region what we saw so far is that the outgrowth was uh, uh, increasing as function of the diffusion coefficient, but actually for some regime, diffusing faster is, uh, is not uh, enhancing tissue outgrowth, but the contrary. And this is due to the fact that when cells need a very large density of ISP to accelerate their cell proliferation, that means that diffusion goes against this and prevent them to diffuse fast, um, to proliferate faster because it decreases actually, uh, diffusion decreases the local concentration of signals. So that means that if cells are very uh, sensitive to high density zones, then that means that increasing the diffusion prevent the outgrowth to be, uh, to be larger. This would be something very interesting to test experimentally actually, if we had a way to play on the, um, on the, the diffusion parameters of the signals. Uh, and uh, yes, okay, and I'm already late, so I'm sorry. Uh, so some, uh, some conclusions. So uh, 
The model uh, is able to reproduce experimental outgrowth in axolotl regeneration. What we were kind of uh, su surprised and we want to work more on that is uh, when we realized that the experimental outgrowth in axolotl correspond to the very, uh, the, the, uh, is optimal in the sense in the parameter space, it means that it's, it's, it's the, uh, the largest that we can hope for uh, with the model that we propose here, with the parameters that we propose here, this was uh, kind of uh, kind of interesting. And uh, and so the model, this model plus the model uh, proposed by Osvaldo shows at least brings some arguments such that axolotl regeneration could be mainly driven by the, uh, the acceleration of cell proliferation due to a chemical signal that is present in the tissue during the tissue development. So of course, there are, this, this is ongoing work, so the, it's the PhD of Valeria Caliaro, and there are a lot of uh, perspectives and, uh, and things to do uh, still. So on a the theoretical viewpoint, what we would like to do uh, after is to derive a continuous model uh, from the agent-based dynamics in order to be able to theoretically analyze the model. Uh, so it would be a model that is close to reaction diffusion in growing domains where the growth of the domain actually depends on the concentration of the chemicals. So that would be very interesting to uh, see whether we can completely characterize the parameter space in a theoretical viewpoint. And in a modeling viewpoint also, uh, what we wanted to do. So for the moment, as you see, the cell division is still biased, very biased into the, uh, along the AP axis of the axolotl. The idea would be to um, try to look at the influence of asymmetric cell divisions. So if um, uh, does, uh, does uh, um, cell division orientation has an impact on the structures and on the structures of the front, for instance, on the overall outgrowth of the tissue, etc. What we would like also to see, so for the moment, the division is symmetric in the sense that a cell creates another cell of the same type we would like to uh, also go to 3D in order to model. Uh, so I don't, uh, I think you didn't mention that in your talk as well, so it could be more. But okay, there is, after day nine, there is another phase in regeneration where cells divide in an asymmetric matter. That means that they create uh, a cell that is of another type and that goes out uh, in another part of the tissue. And we would like to see if, uh, if we could in induce, include that in the domain in order to uh, model larger part of the regeneration phase. As you see here, we are focused on the very first early stage of regeneration and the model cannot explain why the tissue stop growing at a point, right? And which is an equilibrium. And this is why we would like a complete model to uh, have the overall process model here. So I will stop here and thank you for your attention. Thanks again, the organizer, and thank my collaborator <laughs> that, uh, that are pictured here. And I would be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. You deserve some applause here. <laughs> thank you very much for this interesting talk. So we're going to take uh, questions um yes yeah, so you can unmute yourself or write uh, through the chat anna has i see a uh, raised hand anna do you want to ask a question sorry i'm just trying to go turn my video on and i'm not quite sure what is happening see you um can you hear me at least yes yes we can hear you oh, yes we can. okay sorry so, um, yeah, thanks a lot for these uh, talks. They were very, very interesting. Um, and and uh, I just wanted to, 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 to make sure that I understood a few things. I mean, um, first, uh, I guess for Diane, I mean, I, um, uh, I will, I'm trying to understand, was this zone of high proliferation constant in size over time? Um, and, you know, how, if, if so, you, how, um, so, so it starts, I guess, all of a sudden, but isn't there some kind of transient behavior in which the size changes and then it stops? How does it evolve over time? Okay, so actually in the model, the size of the zone is not prescribed. It's just given by uh, the, 
diffusion and the, um, uh, an interplay between diffusion and degradation. And actually, for some, it depends on the on where you are in the parameter space. You have uh, when you have large diffusion and small degradation, the the zone is actually constantly growing. Right. right. But you have yeah. also when the degradation is very fast, you see that uh, the zone is located near the front and you have some regime where the size, the size of the zone is actually maintained and transported through the tissue. But right, okay. So, so basically, if, if one could measure the size of this zone of high proliferation, that would directly inform you about the diffusion and degradation parameters in your, in your model. Yeah, that would be yeah, right. That, that, that. That's um, it. I mean, yeah, so I mean, I sort of related to that what I, I didn't, I wasn't sure if I quite understood, you know, how this relates to the one dimensional model. Uh, and in principle, I wasn't actually sure if in the one dimensional model, uh, you assume that uh, there is a time point at which the recruitment occurs. Um, and then after that, it's just maintained without any ongoing signaling, or do you actually um you know or is it not a problem to assume ongoing signaling but then that would make certain predictions about the speed with which this signal must be diffusing and so on so so what exactly were you thinking there right so uh, basically what um in principle what the model assumes is that uh, you have the process of recruitment started right uh, after amputation and it goes on until a certain time so during this time, the process of recruitment is uh, basically occurring, if you like. Uh, but, uh, and what we assume is that after this time, there is no more recruitment, right? But uh, in this model, the, the idea, which is very simple, is that the, the, during the process of recruitment, the cells engage irreversibly in this um, process of acceleration, if you like. So, so it means that the signal only acts once during right. this process. And so th this is basically the main assumption that we have behind, behind, right? That we have one signal which operates only once and the time for this signal to recruit cells operates for, uh, well, for a certain time that in principle we, don't, we didn't know what it was. And uh, according to the fitting of the model to the um, experimental re results, it looks like this is between three to four days. Okay. And, and then yeah, maybe a comment. Yeah. No, no, no. no. Just a minor comment concerning the experimental side from the uh, this um, uh, proliferation zone that Diane was mentioning, and concerning your question, Anna. Uh, so what we know for sure is that this uh, proliferation zone in the axolotl spinal cord uh, grows in time. So it is not existent, let's say, before four days post amputation, and then after four days up until eight days or so, it's in, it's increasing in size and moving posteriorly. So it's actually doing three times, uh, three things at once, if you like. So on one hand, it doesn't exist before four days, and then it does exist. That's the first thing that it does. The second thing is that it's expanding over time, the proliferation zone. And the third thing is that it's moving posteriorly over time. Right, right, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, just uh, another more sort of technical question that uh, I was thinking, but I couldn't answer it to myself is, if you were to make a 2D um, extension of your model, um, as it is, the, the very simple model, yeah. um, what would change? Because I mean, in terms of rates of proliferation, that, that shouldn't change depending on dimensionality, right? So the movement of the switching point, for instance, should remain the same, is that correct? Yes and no, in the sense that, uh, I mean, generally speaking, yes. But the problem is that in the 1D model, right, all the divisions take place, well, in, this, in the only dimension in which we are. But in 2D, in principle, you could, you know, divide in every other direction uh -huh. as, as well, right? So it means that uh, you could anticipate that if you don't have a bias uh, in, into the AP axis, uh, you could imagine that the rhythm of proliferation should lead to a smaller outgrowth. Okay. Uh, so the, the orientation of cell division actually should play a role. And um, in this direction, we actually measured this orientation uh, four years ago in the axolotl. 
And so we showed that during the process of regeneration, there is a bias in the sense that most of the uh, divisions that these ependymal cells have uh, occur along the AP axis during the process of regeneration. And uh, funny enough, uh, this happened uh, in this high proliferation zone. So the cells which are behind this area, they basically move or divide randomly. And whereas when they are within this high proliferation zone, you have kind of a bias in the sense that the cells tend to orient along the AP axis. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you for the question. Okay, thank you. We have one more question. I think it has been answered partially, but let me uh, read it in the chat. Angelica has asked, uh, she has said, thank you for a nice talk. Do you know whether the signal might be taken up by the cells it activates? Will that make a difference or did you assume it and I miss it? How well is the diffusion constant of the signal known experimentally? So it is two separate questions. Right. So, uh, Diane, uh, do you want me to answer? Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, uh, um, concerning the first question, I, I think that, as you say, I think it wouldn't matter. So basically, it, I mean, in general, it would be the same, whether the signal will be degraded or it would be uh, took up by the cells in general. Uh, but of course, if we would be able to measure this, uh, then we could see whether the rhythm of one thing or the other could be different, right? But we don't know that. And then coming to the second question, uh, how well is diffusion constant of the signal known experimentally? Uh, zero known. So we, we basically ignore completely uh, what the signal might be. So th there are some indications, and Anna knows very well uh, all the signals that uh, can operate in the spinal cord um, in, in, in other organisms. Um, but we don't know which is the signal which is operating here in particular. Th there are some indications So um, from Eri Tanaka. So she, um, so, um, she published, uh, when was that, like three years ago or four years ago, a nature paper in which she showed that there is a marks-like protein which is sufficient and uh, necessary to trigger the proliferation that leads to amputation, uh, to, sorry, to regeneration. The, the only problem is that, so she was able to um, determine the kinetics characteristics of this protein and in the process of regeneration of the spinal cord, but it wasn't really um, possible to actually monitor whether, uh, how is uh, this signal spatially distributed. So we don't know whether this is the signal which is controlling the process or not. So it's, it's actually an open question and it would be fantastic to, to um, unveil the chemical nature of this signal. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any more questions? Yes, me? Please go That's ahead. Okay, Christian. <laughs> uh, maybe more to the end, but I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, your proliferation rate, you made it dependent on the signal concentration. Yeah. Now, if the diffusion is very high, you get proliferation deep inside the tissue. And since essentially you assume that the tissue is incompressible, the cells will have to overcome quite a lot of pressure maybe for proliferation. So wouldn't it be make sense to also have kind of a mechanical influence on the proliferation rate? Yeah, completely. Can you do that? <laughs> yeah, we could also make the difference. So for the moment, uh, you're completely right. The division uh, of cells only depends on the amount of chemicals that it sends. We could also make it depend on uh, the mechanical constraints sensed by uh, the cells, preventing uh, them to, because there are also experimental uh, data that uh, seem to concur, concur with this hypothesis that cells divide uh, uh, slower when they, when they are high pressure. Um, this, this is something that uh, we completely ignored in our, in our model as a first approximation, but that we could uh, that we could easily incorporate by making, for instance, computing the because we it's a agent-based model, so we have access to the forces on the that are exerted on the cells. We could directly make the cell proliferation speed depend on that. Yes. Can I ask one more? <laughs> it, Please it, go ahead. It has to do with kind of 
uh, it has to do with kind of frames of reference. Uh, when you when you uh, you always um, minimize your uh, interaction energy basically instantaneously, if I understood correctly, right? At each time step, and then but then the way you minimize it is this gradient flow, and the physical meaning of this gradient flow is that there is actually some friction which a non with a non-moving environment. Is there such a non-moving environment? So other cells. Is there friction between cells and something uh, around? Because in principle, you could minimize your interaction energy in many ways. Eh? Yeah, that's true. That's an experimental question as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's a fantastic question, actually. Uh, so, um, in principle, yes. So we, we could imagine that there are the surrounding cells uh, to the spinal cord actually produce a framework, if you like from which these cells are actually moving. So in principle, we could imagine that, and those cells actually do not uh, proliferate as faster as these guys actually do. So it means that we can consider them as a uh, inertial reference frame, if you like. So therefore, in principle, this, this, this uh, should justify the, the idea of doing this in this way. But it's, it's really good, yeah, sorry. No, no, there is a similar question concerning the diffusion, right? Exactly, is, yeah. Is yeah, the, yeah. Is the chemical to... taken along with the cells when they right. move? Or, yeah, uh... right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, okay. and no, they diffuse in a, in a surrounding medium, actually. Mm -hmm. they, don't, right. they are not transported by the cells. We suppose that they diffuse uh, on the uh, background and they are taken up by the cells. Yeah, this is the yeah. However, when the, the cell, when the cells move, they might take along that or yeah. surrounding medium also, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we, this is something also that, uh, that uh, we consider that we're going to consider a convection, a, a, a convection between reaction for the ISP to say that they are transported also by the tissue cell. But uh, for the moment, as, as it is written here, the model does not consider that just diffusion in the background. Mm -hmm. 